Hello, and welcome to Hope Unabridged. I'm Casey Brennan. I'm Angie Elkin. And we have a super special guest today. I'm so excited. We have Makoto Fujimura on, and he is just one of my favorite artists, first of all. (laughs) And I'm just such a huge fan of his words. Mm -hmm. I mean, his words are are art in and of itself. Yeah. Makoto Fujimura is a leading contemporary artist whose art is process-driven and has been referred to as slow art. I love that. It has been described by David Brooks of New York Times that his art is a small rebellion against the quickening of time. I love that too. As well as being a leading contemporary painter, Fujimura is also an arts advocate, writer, and speaker who is recognized worldwide as a cultural influencer. So I'm so excited to to dive into this conversation about just art and faith and theology and Mm -hmm. just the intertwining of it all and just how we are, we are made to create, we are made to make. It's funny because I don't think that's something that we often think go together, Mm -hmm. art, theology, creating, all of it. But, um, obviously if you're an artist, it's going to affect your faith is going to affect every Mm -hmm. area of what you do. So I'm excited to hear from him and And figure out, like, what exactly can I learn and how can I be more creative? Mm -hmm. How can I be more of an artist? And how does that bring glory to God? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Well, I know his work is super spiritual, too, just everything that he does. So I'm excited to find out what that looks like for him. Me, too. Yeah. So we're so excited to have you. Welcome, Mako. Well, thank you for having me. (laughs) Um, Your work in the Nihonga tradition, am I saying that Mm -hmm. correctly? Um, That's right. Can you walk us through what that process looks like? Because it's so fascinating. Right, uh, Nihonga it's it's literally Japanese style painting, and and uh, the the there's a whole genre of um, very uh, traditionally uh, Thai uh, way of painting, and you uh, basically using minerals. I'll show you uh, azurite uh, rock here, um, oh, wow. oh, that, wow. um, yeah. which gets pulverized by hand and creates these. Uh, oh. little prismatic yeah. um, minerals and that gets mixed uh, here in the studio with animal hide glue and what you see behind me is is uh, azurite um, on uh, canvas here yeah. but uh, traditionally use paper and mm. this painting on uh, on my uh, left is is uh, uh, it was just completed recently for show and um, it's on paper and oh. so paper stretched uh, or silk or um, you know traditional materials mm-hmm. minerals uh, sumi ink which is calligraphy ink or gold or silver uh, often uh, is used uh, since uh, 16th 17th century wow. amazing and i i modify it a little bit using space age materials yeah. <laughs> here, uh, today uh, for to paint these larger paintings uh, but basically i'm using a very traditional way of what i call slow slow art yeah you know, you're ma- mixing your own paint and painting in layers sometimes uh, work like uh, this in, on my left side is uh over 80 to 100 layers before mm. you start uh, building an image. So it's, wow. it's, it is really slow. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that, though. And you um, you talk a lot in your book, which is just fabulous, by the way, Art and Faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and just how your process is very spiritual, liturgical. Can you yeah. go into that a little bit of, and kind of mm-hmm. paint us the picture, if you will, of what that, what that is mm-hmm. for you and what that does? Art has always been spiritual to me i didn't know what that meant until you know i i began to understand the voice of christ in creation and i began to uh read the bible and begin to connect what i was experiencing viscerally in painting i i always felt uh, like something was going through me and even as a child and um i didn't i thought everybody had this experience and um you know, I went to middle school in New Jersey. Not to, you know, talk about these things. You know, and and then you know, eventually, I I realized that this was a gift, um, and I I didn't know where this gift was coming from, but I wanted to honor that. So I I, I used to talk to my friends about being called to be an artist because mm-hmm. this is something that I really have to do without any kind of incentive to do so, um, and. 
you know, I had I had responsibility to it somehow, and I, um, and it was it was until I I understood what Jesus um, of Nazareth was saying, um, and it was introduced. Bible has introduced me slowly over time uh, through literature, mm -hmm. and and um, so I I began to read the Bible through Western literature like William Blake and Milton and 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 others and and so uh, I, I began to connect the dots um, and eventually realized that it was Christ's voice all along that I was mm -hmm. hearing as a child mm -hmm. and studio is the most sacred space um, to me uh, when I'm here in my studio um, I am most alive and mm -hmm. I, I, I have this I am in touch with the Holy Spirit directly. I feel, and uh, so that's that's a privilege to be able to do what I do, what I love as an artist. Um, you know, spending time making beauty, and then, uh, but most importantly, I'm connected to the the great artist um, who mm. gave me this gift. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. You, you talk about the liturgy of painting, and mm -hmm. I think that many of us think of church when mm -hmm. we think of liturgy. Mm -hmm. So could you unpack that a little bit? How is painting liturgical for you? Yes. And are there things in our everyday lives that could serve sure. as liturgy mm -hmm. for us? Yes, sure. There's been much written over the recent times about how even though, you know, we may talk about liturgy in church but we are liturgical animals you know <laughs> we, we have uh social liturgies like super bowl or you know <laughs> go, going shopping or something like that and and these these are things that we do regularly that we don't um perhaps think about as liturgies but they are liturgy or the ordinary as uh, mm -hmm. you know um as uh, one of the great books of you know of the past have said and and so i, I think you know for me uh, making slow art because it is very intentional and it slows me down and and i'm using my hands and um you know really connected with the materials um and what you know i'm mixing pigments by hand so i, I i'm feeding my way into and through uh what i do and and then of course the layers uh, that takes time to dry and i'm, I'm watching my paintings mm. dry every, every day. <laughs> and and um you know that those those are things that um is constant and uh to me they are uh just as liturgical um mm -hmm. of a rhythm uh that, that, that builds into my life um and and you can you can do that through different uh series of paintings that i've done uh through the psalms to mm -hmm. the work monumental work behind me is called walking on water mm -hmm. um and so the, these are meditations on certain themes and um so th that kind of also accentuates uh this rhythm of thinking uh liturgically and and mm. making liturgically and 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 all these things are overlapping. Mm. I love that. One of the things that um, drew me to your work was uh, kin kintsugi. Am I saying that right? Yeah, that's kintsugi. that's correct. Yeah, and just yeah. taking what's broken and you're you're filling it in with gold and just and making mm -hmm. it more beautiful. And I just I yeah. love first of all, I love that art, but then also I just love how it correlates to our relationship with Christ and just how yeah. um mm -hmm. you're making you're taking something that's broken and you're making it even more beautiful. Can you talk about that yeah. a little? <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um yeah, I have a chapter um Kintsugi mm -hmm. in my my book called Past Faith and uh, you know here's a here's a ball um yes. that uh tea tea wear the kintsugi came out of tea tradition in japan and when a tea bowl like this breaks you know the the families of uh tea tea masters will often hold on to it mm -hmm. for generations mm -hmm. and then they'll give it to a, a japan lacquer master 
and to mend it, but the, the Japan lacquer master does not mend to make it back to what it, the, you know, as, as if nothing happened. <laughs> mm. uh, they accentuate the fractures as it is here. In, mm -hmm. in the, um, you know, this this was the part that was broken. Mm. But but then this this ball actually was done by a, a friend of mine, designer who who did kintsugi for the first time in our oh, workshop, nice. and uh, uh, because we we've been running these kintsugi workshops uh, modified uh, for contemporary time, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, kintsugi is very difficult to master because Japan lacquer is notoriously difficult to master. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes like six months to dry. In a, you know, it has mm -hmm. to be a certain right condition. And um, but um, in my, I, we we developed a way to 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 do this in uh, basically three hours, and any, anybody can do it. Uh, this authentic kintsugi, um, and the idea is right. As, uh, it's not to fix, but to yeah. mend, to make new. Yeah. Um, and so the resulting kintsugi bowl is more valuable than the mm -hmm. original. And to me, that is a just mm. a perfect example of the theology of new mm. creation. And, um, you know, Jesus' post-resurrection appearance includes his nail marks and wounds. And um, to, to, to <clears throat> us, that, that may be, a, um, you know, post-Easter uh, detail, but, but it's, it's a very significant uh, theological reality that, you know, somehow these woundings, um, uh, certainly Christ's sacred wounds, uh, through his wounds we are healed. Mm -hmm. But but even in our lives, when we go through fracture and, and woundings, you know, what does that mean in terms of new creation? And mm -hmm. uh, the Bible seems to be pretty clear that God doesn't erase what happens, but God mends to make new, mm -hmm. uh, which means even our woundings and our experience of fractures um, uh, is, is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, and there are no more tears on the other side of eternity, but they are something that we can only experience through uh, our own journey into darkness and trauma that is amplified and made beautiful on the other mm. side. Yeah. And I love like just going back to what you said a moment ago, it's difficult to master. Like even that, yeah. like even our brokenness, it's difficult to call out and recognize and and yeah. and renew that. I just right. think that's so beautiful. And I love, I love the art. Yeah. I want to never throw anything away. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I love that you said it the purpose is actually to accentuate the mm -hmm. brokenness yeah. or accentuate the crack. Yeah. Uh, because so often we, when we are wounded or hurt or broken, we think we should hide it or even throw away broken things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I love this idea. It's, it's like you said, it's very biblical. God makes all things new. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so to think that we could surrender in our brokenness and just say, God, make this something new and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that's what he does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. It's good. Um, I, w I want to go to the church for a minute because I know you said you asked a line in there and it really stuck out to me. And I've been like yeah. marinating on this yeah. ever since I read it. But like, what did you make this week? Like yes. if we all walked into the church and that's the, that's <laughs> what we're going in thinking, like, what did I make this week rather than yeah. going about our little, you know, right. original lives. But um, tell us what you mean by that and just kind of break that down for us. Right. The Bible begins with, the creator creating uh, not out of needs as we would, um, mm -hmm. but God, God is perfectly self-sufficient and all-sufficient and doesn't need to create anything. Mm -hmm. So, so we're not needed, and you know the universe is not needed by God. But so, why did God create? Um, God created uh, because God is love, mm -hmm. and love always makes our love is always generating something uh, gratuitous and excessively beautiful <laughs> yeah yeah that's so great i know um just from my experience of talking with artists i know that often your own trauma or pain informs your art how has that been true of you well it's been true in multiple ways um and you know i'm i'm convinced that you will not have any enduring work of art in history without having gone through mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. trauma. You, you know, yeah. you certainly don't have 
Hemingway. You don't, you don't have <laughs> J.D. Salinger, right. you know, traumatized by the war. You would have not have C.S. Lewis or Tolkien or Dante or Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare, uh, the, the theater was built outside of London because of the Black Plague. Mm-hmm. Um, and Shakespearean way of doing theater, which was obviously profoundly innovative, but but it was a result of people needing to quarantine um, yeah. in, in theaters in layers, and layers, mm. and you know, so Romeo and Juliet, <clears throat> you know, is it, playing off the you know the high high um, layers of uh, royalties, and and then you know, and yeah. then the common commoners on the bottom. And and the, these things, I, I, I just realized, I didn't realize, uh, you know, I, I used to talk about war traumas and art uh, mm-hmm. as a substantial contribution. But now I, I feel like going through the pandemic, um, you know, we all have this uh, something in common now, right. this experience of going through this. And, and that might be an opportunity to think about how we are connected and, mm-hmm. and beauty is often created out of trauma. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at the works of Van Gogh, or you look at any any work um, that mm-hmm. you know, Frangelico, uh, in in times when you know Black Plague mm-hmm. was killing so many people in Europe, mm-hmm. and, and all these upheavals going on in religion and politics and invasions yeah. and war, and and yet he created beauty, and and I I think that those are examples uh, you know we think about them in the past but now it it is actually essential in order for us to live it's not enough to survive Mm -hmm. you know it's not i mean we are all survivors you know Mm -hmm. uh, in 2021 Mm -hmm. but but it we have to do something about the value of what you know ask what is life and why are we here and um, one clear answer to me is that we, we're here to create beauty, to reflect God's beauty into the world. Uh, we're, we're here given the capacity to create something new into mm-hmm. the world, which, which is like incredible uh, privilege that um, we often don't think about, talk about. Mm-hmm. Certainly in the church, we don't hear preaching, you know, about, you know, <laughs> what did you make today, you know? Right. And, and and yet this is a brandy um, reality of the gospel. And and I, I you know when Paul says we are in Christ, we're a new creation. We we are you know that that is fundamentally the reality of how we are our identity as the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Speaking uh, of the body of Christ. Um, our heart has gone out to the Asian community in uh, mm. recent days, mm-hmm. and we're wondering how the hate crimes against the Asian community have affected you. This is human sin, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and we need to name it as, as, as you know, Japanese have been historically horrible to the Koreans, mm. and and that you know that means so so there's there's racism in Mm -hmm. Asian countries against each other Mm -hmm. there, you know, so, uh, you know, there's in us, there's a divide between the South and and the North, you know, still like, and, and, and so if if you, it doesn't matter what your race is, human sin has created this facade of, uh, and, and, and the schism within our hearts that, um, that we don't often talk about you know directly mm-hmm. and say that that is abs- you know abhorrent and sinful yeah and and these activities that we all have been part of um you know both perpetrating and receiving are not anything new right. um we and, and and in some ways you know identifying uh, one race over another for a certain period and forgetting about it you know is 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 just as bad you yeah. know, like because we're in a sense scapegoating, right? We're mm-hmm. saying, oh, oh, okay, so we realize there's something wrong with us, and oh, right now we're gonna, you know, we're gonna look at this particular right. area of wrong, <laughs> wrongness, and 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 you know, it's 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 true universally. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm grateful that people are noticing now that mm-hmm. you know these grandmothers are, you know, in. in in um, certain cities are being, you know, accosted all the time, 
and mm. and we we didn't notice it before, yeah. um, so I'm grateful that we're noticing it now. Uh, but it's it's nothing new, unfortunately. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I want to um, share this line because it just it stood out to me too as you were talking, um, just because it, it's relatable. Mm. But this, I want to hear how what this means for you because this line yeah. means so much to me. Um, in your book, it says, "Art also reveals the roar which lies on the other side of silence." And I feel like that's where we're at right now, right? Like just yeah. in in all the different areas of what we're going through in the country. Um, it's yeah. that roar that lies on yeah. the other side of silence. And I would just love to hear, you know, your thoughts on that. Yeah, poets have a way of articulating what we all sense mm. inside, but we don't have the words to. That's yeah. George Eliot in, in the middle of March. And and I, I think those, uh, you know, lines are so important. I'm right now mm-hmm. writing an essay on T.S. Eliot's four mm-hmm. quartets, and um, I'm, I'm realizing to what extent Eliot and others have captured the, the sense of loss and, yeah. and, and also the sense of hope mm-hmm. at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to do that, right? So, you know, I, I was a ground zero resident in New York City. I lived three blocks away from the towers and my children mm-hmm. became ground, ground zero children mm-hmm. and raised them that way. Um, but, you know, it's really hard to hold on to uh, hope and despair at the same time you know we're lamenting for those who lost their lives and and at the same time realizing that this there is a certain mm. way that tragedy and you know uh, horror yeah. and and trauma gives birth to something new and and that that is the birthing pains that we are experiencing um but you know at at the same time it's real and it's painful and it 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 really hurts and Mm. you know it's not just that event but what ensues is the brokenness is amplified and all that is happening is you know reflected in in the uh, brokenness of relationships you know, um, and the solution of covenants, and 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 all that you know happens, uh, you know, not not during the pandemic, but post pandemic. So we're going to be talking about yeah. 2020 for a long for a time, long time. And, you know, <laughs> and and I'm about to go through a very difficult uh, 20th anniversary of 9/11. Mm. Uh, it's going to be hard, I, I, and yet all the things that I learned in 20 years, you, you know, it's almost directly applicable mm. to everything yeah. that we're going through now, 20 years from now. Mm. Yeah. Um, kids who, who, you know, experience universities <laughs> during the pandemic, right. right? They couldn't even go to the universities yeah. that they they worked so hard to get into. Mm. Is gonna remember this time, and and they they'll have they have lingering traumas, a certain ways that this time has caused them to to adjust and change, um, and 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 yet you know that's that's also a way that we can we can kind of create into the new. Mm-hmm. Um, so so those uh, lines of poets are enduring because they they continue to speak Mm -hmm. right and and uh, you know when when you're quarantined and you're faced with the reality of not being able to go to church or not being able to meet your friends or hug your grandchildren or your grandmother you know you you're you're really forced to Look at nature as as a voice, as a as a, as a so, you know as, as as real as a human being speaking to us, right? And mm-hmm. and and in that isolation, we perhaps can hear better. Mm. Uh, you know, the world on the other side of silence. Yeah, such a hopeful conversation. Yes. I love hearing you talk about your art and how mm-hmm. it make, brings beauty out of brokenness and. Uh, our show is called Hope Unabridged, and so we love to ask every guest that we have on this final question: Where are you finding hope these days? Yeah, so um, my art 
uh, which uses pulverized pigments. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you literally break up the pigments, and then mm. they are become prismatic, um, and I layer them over and over so that the surface, even though mm. some of them seem monochromatic, uh, you know, a blue painting isn't blue when you sit with it a long time. Uh, your eyes adjust and you see rainbows yeah. where you see pr prisms, you know, because wow. they're literally prisms on wow. the surface. And that to me has gotten me through some of the most, the darkest times of my life. Mm. Um, just, just having the discipline to come into my studio and just going through the motions when I, I when I didn't feel like it or mm. I didn't have any hope um i went through a very dark period uh about four years ago and um i remember um uh, i had a, i had recently had a show at gonzaga university museum and i displayed this 33 feet long foot long painting it's mm, huge wow. called uh silence mysterium and i i was thinking about make you know i was looking at it and i was thinking like I cannot remember painting this painting hmm, wow. because I was going through such trauma yeah. and I was dis disassociating everything. Wow. So I have photographs of me painting. My assistant mm -hmm. took that, I, I, but I don't remember painting it. Hmm. The only thing that I had left was years of training in, in making art and showing up in a studio, mixing paint and then mm. doing layers and layers. Wow. And because of that, this painting is probably the most uh, ego-less, you know, uh, most most beautiful because I'm not there, mm. you know, and, and yet that's, that's the signature of something that is enduring. When you can leave your ego out, when you, you know, mm. when you can leave yourself out of the painting yeah. so completely that you can't even remember it. And, and then the work and the discipline carries you into that hope that you see on on the canvas there there's hope built into the canvas and i i i, wow. I didn't make it that was that was purely the spirit mm. speaking through a very traumatized person mm. and and had no you know strength really to even even go to the studio but a friend of mine called me every day and said go to the studio <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so I, I i went and i'm so glad because that that you know here's a here's a proof that you know faith is the substance of things hoped for mm, yeah. the evidence of things unseen you know and and we have that discipline of making it, it carries us it carries mm -hmm. us beyond ourselves it carries us beyond our, our darkness mm, that is beautiful, beautiful. Oh, this this conversation has been such a treasure, and I just want to, I could keep talking to you all day, but um, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for you so just much. sharing yeah. your wisdom and your Absolutely. art and Absolutely. your words. Yeah, you are um, an inspiration. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today on Hope and Abridged. We'd like to remind you, if you're watching us on Good Life 45, you can also listen to these episodes everywhere you listen to podcasts. If you're listening and you would like to see the filmed version of the show or any of our other shows, check us out on Good Life 45 or on our YouTube channel and our app. We hope that something you heard today really blessed you, and we would love for you to share the show with those you love. Just hit that share button on your podcast app or on YouTube and send it to a friend, and we would love it if you would leave us a review. With this program, we are finding hope in the unedited stories of our lives, and we want you to do the same. 